So, strapping a propeller to a railway carriage does in fact make it go very fast, but is also very inefficient in the long term. Plus, an uncovered metal blade spinning at about 2,500 RPM at the same height as a person is also probably not a safe idea either. Propeller-powered rail vehicles very quickly came and went. However, with the invention of jet engines, it wasn't long before someone got the bright idea to strap a few thrusters onto a train and let her rip. One of the first engines to be jet-propelled was the M497, built by the New York Central Railroad in 1966. Nicknamed the Black Beetle by the press, all it really was was a bud-rail diesel car with streamlining fitted to the front and two General Electric J47-19 jet engines fitted to the roof. The same type of jet engine that was used as boosters on the Convair B36 Peacemaker Intercontinental Bomber which, for reference, had a max speed of nearly 435 miles an hour. It was tested between Butler, Indiana and Stryker, Ohio, managing to hit 183 miles an hour on the 23rd of July 1966, a speed record that still stands today. Despite its speed and how relatively cheap it was to build, the project wasn't considered commercially viable, and the engine was put to the side, having its jets removed and being put back into standard commuter service. Later, while experimenting with linear induction motors and gas turbine-powered engines, Garrett Air Research built the Linear Induction Motor Research Vehicle, or LIMRV as it was known, as part of an ongoing project to experiment with and develop hovertrains. There's an awful lot of sciencey stuff to do with lift and friction and all kinds of motors, engines and doodads around the project, but simply put, the engine ran on standard gauge rails to test the effectiveness of using linear induction motors. On its own, during testing, it managed to hit a speed of 187.9 miles an hour, but due to the short length of the track it was tested on, it didn't have much time to accelerate to its top speed. To get around this, two Pratt & Whitney J52 engines were fitted to improve the vehicle's acceleration. After accelerating, the jets would be throttled down to only produce the same amount of thrust as they did drag, so as to not affect the overall results of the vehicle's speed tests. It was during one of these tests that, once up to speed, it managed to travel at 255.7 miles an hour, achieving a world speed record for conventional rail vehicles. Meanwhile, in 1970, the USSR wanted to develop up the design for an electric train that could run at 200 kilometers an hour. Part of the development required a way of testing different bogies and wheel sets on the railways without them being motorized. As the USSR didn't have any rolling stock that could maintain a speed of 200 kilometers an hour at the time, they decided to fit two AI turbojet engines to the motorhead car of an ER-22 electric train and added additional streamlining to the car's front. This way, different unpowered wheels or bogies could be easily swapped out and tested, with the jets providing the power needed to move the vehicle along. Known as the high-speed laboratory car, it played a significant role in the designing and development of the RT200 passenger cars and the electric multiple unit ER200s. In the February of 1972, it managed to reach 249 kilometers an hour. While not exactly a worldwide speed record, as the USSR used slightly wider than average tracks, it was still an impressive speed for the time. By 1975, the experiments were concluded and the high-speed laboratory car was no longer needed. It was left at Doroshika Station, where it remained parked for over 30 years. Plans to move it to a museum in St. Petersburg were made in the late 90s, but due to the poor condition of the car, it was decided that it would just stay where it was. In 2008, the front end of the car was cut off, painted, and installed as a steel to mark the 110th anniversary of the carriage works where it was built. You've probably noticed by now that out of the three examples of experimental jet-powered trains I've shown, only one of them was ever really intended for passenger use. The reason for this is because powering or adding a jet to a locomotive is simply just inefficient, and most engineers knew this. As stated previously when I spoke about propeller-powered carriages, vehicles driven by jet or propeller propulsion possess great speed capabilities but lack the necessary power to pull additional carriages too, severely limiting their carrying capacity. On top of this, they also lack the power needed to climb steep gradients, and as a result can only really traverse nearly perfectly flat rails. 
Travelling at slower speeds or shunting under their own power is also very difficult if the car is solely jet-driven, not to mention the noise jet engines make and how disruptive they would be for both passengers and the surrounding areas they would pass through. An argument could be made that powering the wheels of the car conventionally and having the jets fitted for extra bursts of speed is more viable, but given how much fuel jet engines use in comparison to a standard diesel-electric engine, it just makes more sense to put more power to the wheels rather than fitting jets. So, overall, most carriages fitted with jets weren't really built for commercial use on public railways, but rather to help figure a few things out along the way while developing locomotive power. While it's most certainly impractical to just strap a jet engine to a locomotive, you have to admit, just looking at it makes you feel a need. A need for speed. Subscribe for more.